والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوم ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لهم أجرا كبيرا صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وعلى محمد I begin in Allah's name the beneficent the merciful and Allah deserves all praise for having created us when he didn't have to and he has done so purely due to his mercy and he sustains us due to his mercy he tests us due to his mercy he gives us trials and tribulations due to his mercy he forgives us due to his mercy and he rewards us due to his mercy and he even punishes us due to his mercy and of course his guidance comes in many ways as we know the self is guided the self has been taught wrong and right wa nafsi wa ma sawaha the self has been completed and taught wrong and right and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent us 124,000 prophets Adam being the first unlike the Abrahamic faiths where Jews and Christians consider Adam to be the first human being on earth they do not consider him to be the first prophet on earth whereas in Islam we considered Adam as not only the first human being but the first prophet of God because the prescription and the design of God's system on this earth while we are on trial on this earth is that we have to have a leader and a guide at all times otherwise the trial is nullified and that leader should be an individual among those who are being tested meaning that when prophets are sent to a, a people they must be similar to the people you cannot have an angel who is a prophet to humans because they're different in creation and therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always tells us that prophets are among you they're humans like you so you know in, in other words he, they come from our own communities and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ensured that these prophets are chosen at birth they are guided at birth and while they can make mistakes they don't while they can go astray they don't meaning they do not disobey Allah they are as we call infallible prophets do not make mistakes even the notion that Adam made a mistake when he approached the tree is not true it's a misunderstanding and while the Quran may allude to that slightly it's a trial upon us to understand what did Adam really do as a brief introduction, you will see that before Adam salam, was created, Allah had decreed Adam to come to earth because that's in the Quran. And Allah decreed it to the angels and informed them that He is going to place on earth His representative. And this is before Adam was given His soul and spirit, before Adam did anything number one so we need to understand it's very important that Allah decreed Adam to come to this earth this Christian ideology of the original sin of Adam with all due respect is incorrect it's greatly exaggerated it's used in the wrong ways it has marginalized societies it has caused us to look at the divine system in a very convoluted way when in fact God's mercy is pervasive God's mercy is the overarching reason as to why he created us. Adam did not commit a sin, nor did he make a mistake. It was by decree and design. And I don't want to go too deep into it. I know this conversation always continues in public. But we need to be very careful about this. I've heard even among our Muslim scholars in different schools of thought use this, that, you know, um, that Adam was placed in this paradise which is where he was supposed to be but because of his error he was kicked out you see and 
because shaitan was there, you know, Iblis was there to misguide him. And now we are under this terrible trial on this earth to try to reclaim that paradise. That's not true at all. This ideology doesn't have much foundation to stand on for many reasons. Number one, that garden, which we call Garden of Eden by Christian ideologies, uh, is it was a garden, and Alama Tabatabai describes it that possibly it was on an elevated place on earth. It's a garden that was on an elevated space on earth, elevated in a protected way. Number two, it's definitely not the paradise we talk about <coughs> on the Day of Judgment, after the Day of Judgment. That paradise, no disbeliever, rejecter will enter paradise. Now, if this original one which Adam was in was supposed to be that original paradise, then what was Shaitan, the devil, doing there? Because he had already rejected God. He had disobeyed God already. So why is he there? And why is he trying to, you know, accelerate Adam to approach the tree? You have to understand, why is Iblis, Shaitan, trying to accelerate the approach of Adam to the tree? Because Iblis knows that while Adam is in that garden, he cannot do anything to Adam because Adam's trial had not begun yet. So whatever Adam does in this garden, there is no sin in it. There is no rejection in it. Now you might see that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa Adam. When you look at that, actually, it wasn't a mistake of Adam at all. And it's not tarki awla either. It's not the lesser of the good. All of these are not valid arguments because they negate the original principle idea which is a divine decree that Adam was decreed to come to earth by Allah and he did come to earth by Allah's command so anything Adam did in between cannot be the lesser of anything okay now here's the argument that we use to understand it and I'm just introducing this very briefly just as a fundamental principle, because I really want to get into the practicals of our day-to-day -day problems, our social problems, our parenting problems, our societal issues, but foundation, principles, usul, understanding this is the foundation as to why we derive what we derive in the, se in the sense of the practical, ethical laws that we practice. They are built on this foundation. That is why when we believe in Allah and one God, pure, no tainting, no children, lam yalid wa lam yulad, is very important because the minute you taint God, your ultimate goal for good has been tainted. And when your ultimate goal for good has been tainted, then the good you will do will be tainted. And you will say good, uh, you will call something good when it's not good because the ultimate goal is not good. That's why keeping that ultimate approach to Allah is so important as tawheed. When Luqman says, Ya Bunayya, la tushrik billah, inna shirka la dhulmun azim, my son, do not associate anyone with Allah. It is a grievous act for this reason. For even if we associate a thousand gods to God, it does nothing to Allah. But when you and I taint Allah in His purity, then our laws will become impurified, our ideologies will become impurified, our transactions will become impurified, and we will confuse each other. And we will not know what is good from evil. That is why Tawheed is so central. When we talk to our Christian brethren, for example, we should discuss with them the purity of God. Allah says, مَا كَانَ لِلَّهِ أَنْ يَتَّخِذَهُ وَلَدَ سُبْحَانَهُ إِذَا قَضَى أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا يَقُولُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونْ It is not for God. It does not behoove God to take a son for himself. مَا كَانَ لِلَّهِ and yet takhidahu walada that when he takes a son for himself you have belittled him you have lowered him you have made him animated like a human being you see and he's angry with us and you know when we talk about god's pleasure please understand god's pleasure is actually our success whatever comes to us is god's pleasure whatever harms us is god's displeasure understand pleasure and displeasure is animated within us not to god Allah doesn't have happy moments and sad moments. Allah does not fluctuate in emotions. He has no emotions like you and I. You see? God does not have such comparison. There is no comparison to Him. 
Don't compare him with anything. Don't animate him. Don't give him shapes and forms. While our Christian community is loving, they love God. They love God as much as everybody else loves God. 100%. I've seen them. They die for it. And that's wonderful. But we have to talk to them to purify this. Because that purity is essential to understand the methodology, the principles of why God has put us on this earth. And it's very important for us to know this. So this conversation about Adam is simply to make a very clear understanding that the Rahmah of Allah is within the jurisdiction. And there are many, many problematic issues if we are to say that prophets make mistakes. Many problematic issues arise as a result of that. So please be very careful from a philosophical argument. If I get into a debate with somebody who tells me that prophets make mistakes, I will destroy them in a debate. It's very easy because you can corner them a thousand ways and they won't know how to answer. It's very problematic when you do that because God's system dictates a clear trajectory by which there has to be knowledge being imparted to mankind in the clearest of forms. If there's any form of deflection from the truth, then the entire religion of God is suspect. And ideologically, you and I don't have to follow it because we're going to say to God, I don't know if Salah is five times a day or Maghrib is three. We assume it is, but we don't know. So you know what? Even if I don't pray, it's not as bad as if I pray because I'd rather not do something wrong. <laughs> and it becomes very devilish after that. So be, please be very careful. Going back to the issue of Adam, you find that Allah decreed this Rahmah. And Allama gives a magnificent answer in Al-Mizan fi Tafsir al-Quran, which in my opinion, among all the uh, Tafsir that I have read, this one really brings Quran bil Quran to analyze it and to say, first and foremost, why is Allah telling us the story of Adam? It is to establish the universal principles of God in his mercy. And why is Iblis brought forth in the argument? And why is Iblis, who is another form of creation made of fire, being brought into the equation of our conversations? And why is he being removed from grace for disobeying Allah? Because Allah is telling us, as one example, that his principles are universal regardless of what creation you are. If you went to another side of the universe and there were other creations there, we would call them aliens, you would find that as long as they're under test and trial on a moral ground, then they will have the same principles as we have here. It doesn't change. Allah doesn't change His system. It's fixed. We are talking this fixed system. Very important to understand. So Adam did not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah decreed him. But what Allah told Adam was, you and your wife, Hang out in this garden and you will decide when your trial will begin. And that was the instruction. Do not approach this tree for then you will be burdened with a trial. Because the Quran exemplifies ظالمين as لتشقى, meaning to, to toil, to suffer, to struggle in this world. In that garden the, the trial had not begun. So when Allah says Adam approached it, فَعَسَى What Allah means is that he put himself in a state of toil. But putting oneself in a state of toil is divine decree. And if you and I have a problem with that, then let's go to this ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah says, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوءِ وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ We will test you with fear, loss of life, loss of fruits, family, the whole nine yards. Give good news to the Patient ones. فَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبًا They are the ones who when they are in a state of difficulty قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ They say we are from God and we return to God. أُولَيْكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتُ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمَةِ They are the ones who God sends blessings to because they are patient. And then Allah says وَإِذِ ابْتَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ we test you which of you is best in deeds, right? Quran is constant. You are under trial. You are under trial. So it's not something we've done as a mistake. It's the design of God. And when Adam is seeking forgiveness, when he comes to earth, that forgiveness, by the way, in Arabic is ghafara. Ghafara, just quick introduction. Ghafara in Arabic has many meanings. Ghafara, one meaning is to seek forgiveness for a mistake we made. But ghafara also means seeking protection from future mistakes. 
And Quran shows both of us, both, both of those. So I can say to you, forgive me in Farsi, you say, Bibakshi. In Arabic, Zafwan. In English, you say, pardon me, forgive me for asking you this question. But you're not, you have not made a mistake, but you're seeking protection from any accusation. And you find istighfar has two many meanings, but two major ones is seeking forgiveness and seeking protection. So when prophets are seeking istighfar in the Quran, it's the only way to pray to Allah. Iblis does not do istighfar, hence he's condemned. But one needs not make a mistake to do istighfar. And when prophets are praying to Allah, understand their comparison between themselves and Allah is incomparable. Imam Ali alayhi salam in, in the dua he says, Mawla ya ya Mawla anta al-malik wa ana al-mamluk. Fa'al yarhamu al-mamluk illa al-malik. You see? Anta al-raziq wa ana al-marzuq. Fa'al yarhamu al-marzuq illa al-raziq. You say, you are the giver, I am the taker. Who will have mercy on the taker but the giver? There's huge different differentials and when we pray to Allah, how great Allah is. And when prophets talk to us, they are our kind. They don't ask for forgiveness. You'll never find a verse in the Quran where a prophet asks for forgiveness from humans. But they are always asking for forgiveness from Allah. Because Allah's system and design is that when you want to pray to Allah, you have to do istighfar. In fact, let me take it a little bit step further. You notice we pray, salah, every prayer in Islam. Sunnah, Shia, you will find it has two, ruk two ruku, I mean two sujood. Two. Any prayer that has sujood, other than salatul uh, mayyit, you find that it has two sujood. Two sujood. Now why two? Why not three? Salatul ayat, there are five rukus. But you find in Salah, there are only two. The Prophet explains. He says, <clears throat> the Quran says, Minha khalaqnakum, wa fiha nu'idukum, wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. From it you were created, to it you will return, and from it you will be called back. Taratan ukhra, you will be somebody different. The Messenger says, when you do sujood, make sure there is earth between you and your sujood because you are from earth. Quran is saying, Minha khalaqnakum wa fiha nu'idukum and to it you will return and from it you will be brought back. The earth, not carpet, not cloth. And the Prophet has explained that which you eat and you wear should not be done with sujood. You should use earthly matter because that's the power of sujood. It's mentioned in all schools of thought. If the messenger is to come out of the masjid, he would have mud on his forehead. You see? Umm Salma also notices the Prophet had mud on his forehead. And he says to her, this is the earth we bow on. So when we bow on this turba, or this mohar as you call it, it's not worshipping it, it's by decree of the Prophet. But the reason I brought this uh, discussion is that you will notice when we go from first sujood to the second sujood, we have a very quick gap. Sometimes in speed we come up, and quickly we go down. Allahu Akbar, we go back down. But it is mustahab to say, Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu Between the two sujoods. And the messenger was asked, what is the value of this life? He replied, the distance between two sujoods. He said, the distance between two sujoods is this world. You were made from earth, you come on this earth, you will die and go back. That gap from the first sujood to the second is this world. And the messenger said, when you are on this earth, do istighfar all the time, for that is worship. When Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Ibadah, in what form? Our prophets and imams say, istighfar. Seek forgiveness and seek protection. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So we find that istighfar is the, is the design of how we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's this design. So when Adam is saying, Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa in lam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al khasirin, you find the verse is very elegant. It lays it out very beautifully and clearly. And the Quran is a book of guidance, it, it clarifies things. That's why I say, Inna hadha al Qur'ana yahdi lillatihi akwam. It guides us. And there's, Ghayra di iwajan. Quran says, there is no crookedness in this book. Quran and Arabian. 
the book in Arabic, We revealed it in Arabic so you know, because the language of Arabic is very specific, and it has a very unique structure among languages. It is one of the most complicated languages, but it's a very legal language. It's a beautiful, elegant, methodical language. Farsi is beautiful, Urdu is beautiful. The Eastern languages are beautiful. But Arabic has a construction that's much more refined in many ways. You see? And Allah says, we revealed it, so you understand it. So let's pay careful attention to this, because this is how our iman gets stronger. The reason for this discussion, honestly, is so you and I get certainty. And when you and I get certainty, then we will do tawakkal. Tawakkal, in my opinion, is the ultimate behavior in life. Tawakkal meaning you have trust in God. You trust Allah, where you are ready to sacrifice anything and everything for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything and everything. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So when Adam says this, I want to pay careful attention to this very quickly. My topic today, I want to continue to finish Surah Al-Mulk, and I'm going to jump into Surah Al-Hujurat. For us to understand the essence of the divine law in this month the Quran was revealed what does it mean what is the power of the Quran and if you and I can get the energy from this you will understand that we will have no doubt that this is the book of Allah many people come and ask me how do you know the Quran is book of God how do you know was it changed is it being manipulated is there tahrif in the Quran meaning is the Quran missing verses does it have any issues these are conversations we will talk in the next few nights, inshallah, as proof that the Quran is the only book in the world that is the divine book, only book. And I, I will say it on many angles, and you will see. And I stand to be challenged. I'd love for somebody to come and say, no, no, I don't agree with you. I'm more than happy to have a conversation because at the end of the day, we're on a journey to know the truth. If you've got the better truth, share it, please. Right, inshallah. So when Adam is asking, Rabbana dhalamna anfusana, He's saying, our Lord, we are burdened. Because when he comes to earth and Allah says, all three of you go, enemies of each other. Hmm? On one angle, enemies. On the other angle, you'll find humans are brethren. But Iblis was there to create discord. And there's a whole series of verses in the Quran. Another time when I get a chance to discuss it, if time allows, you will see how Allah talks to Iblis and says to Iblis, why did you do this? Why did you refuse to bow? And you see the logic and the principles as to why Allah brought us on this earth. Very important to know. Because when we deal with crises in our lives and we see people dying around us and we see babies being born in hospitals and in homes, we will understand the grand scheme of things. And we won't be confused. So Adam is saying to Allah, we are burdened by this. Rabbana dhalamna anfusana. And he's saying to God, wa illam taghfir lana. If you do not protect us and forgive us, should we make mistakes? We will be losers. Lanakunanna minal khasirin. Now Adam doesn't say, Rabbana khasarna anfusana. He says, Rabbana dhalamna anfusana. Because Adam was not in khasara. He wasn't a loser. We think that he's such a loser that our Christian brethren have taken it so far that we've all become sinners in the flesh. And now we're inheriting sins and we're all sinners and we're all damned and doomed to hell. This is the Pauline ideology. Paul in second, uh, 1 Corinthians says, were Christ not crucified and risen three days later, Christianity is in vain. It has no meaning. Meaning the vicarious atonement of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, as the the one who atoned for the sins of man is a Mithraic idea that predates Christianity. And it is not within the design of Islam for God to do such things that 2,000 years ago God is going to fix the problem of Adam. And that sin takes on a physical component. Please know, sin does not take physical components. Nothing tangible within the five senses is a sin. You cannot touch something called sin. There's no such thing. Fire is not sin. Earthquake is not sin. Death is not sin. Life is not sin. L you know, when you use your tongue and make noise, it's not a sin. But if you lie willfully, 
there is an ethereal presence called sin. It's intangible. It's not physical. No human being is born with skin that's sin. You know, my skin is a sin. There's no such thing. Everything Allah creates is good. God creates everything good, including shaitan. Iblis is a good creation. He's not a bad creation. He's a creation of Allah, and Allah creates everything good. So to make a very quick point here, Adam is saying to Allah, if you don't protect us, we will become losers. And Allah says, Fataba alayhim. God turns to him, and God teaches him the names. And Allah says to the angels, okay, tell me the names that Adam knows. They didn't know. Allah says, Rabbukum a'lamu bima fi nufusikum. God knows. But he says, inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. Allah says to the angels, I know which you don't know. And the reason I chose Adam and I taught them is because their trial on this earth is very difficult. And they will have a very easy way to slip away from me. And they can cause their own damnation. And they can go astray. But they will be vigilant. They will hold themselves in my direction. And they will fight for my causes. They will represent my prophets even though they haven't seen the prophets. Today, we as a Muslim community, two billion of us, we have not seen the Holy Prophet ﷺ in, in physical terms. We haven't seen him. But subhanAllah, though we haven't seen him, we are so vigilant about it. We love him. We are ready to die for him. It's the number one name in the world. You know that? The World Book of Records says Muhammad is the number one name in the world. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Right? It's a beautiful name. The one who's praised. The praised one. What a great name. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that the, the way the prophets behaved is through kindness and through looking uh, you know, at, at the wisdom and the intelligence that Allah has given us. And I'll add one more piece to this and then I'll, I'll conclude on this very quickly. You find in Surah Al-Fatih, Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna fatahna laka fathan mubina, liyaghfira laka Allahu ma taqaddama min dhambik wa ma taakhar, wa yutimma ni'matu alayka, wa yahdika sirata mustaqim. If you listen to this verse, this is the surah number 48, surah al-Fatih. It starts with this, and people say, you see, the Prophet made mistakes. Look, it shows. لِيَغْفِرَ لَكَ اللَّهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِكَ Dham is mistake. So you see, the Prophet made mistakes. Allama describes this beautifully in saying that the mistake Quran is talking about, the sin Quran is talking about, is not the sin of God. It's the sin of Meccans who worship their idols. And the Prophet was back, was coming to reclaim the house of Allah, which was hijacked by the thieves, by shaitan, who took the house of Ibrahim and plastered 360 gods, false gods in there. And the Prophet was after it to cleanse it and reclaim the house of God, which was hijacked. That's what the message, so to the Meccans, the Prophet was a sinner against their gods. So Allah says, we will protect you from that sin that they're accusing you of. But the key operative in this ayah, I want us to pay attention, is Now, if sin and ghafara has a direct correlation to a mistake, then how can Allah forgive the Prophet for future sins? Ta'akhara means what will come in the future. What will come in the future? The only way to translate this verse is that Allah will protect you from accusation now and in the future. The same as Adam is asking, وَإِن لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَّا مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I want to touch briefly, by the way, as I, before I conclude, this philosophical argument is the spirit of our worship. You'll find the Quran clarifies the mishaps of prophets that were accused. We have watched Hollywood movies on prophets. I've watched them on different ones. Yusuf being one of them. Moses being another one. Yaqub being another one. Jacob. It's interesting when you watch Hollywood movies of prophets, they animate them as not human beings that you want to respect much. They are angry all the time. They are arguing with God a lot. 
They do dumb things. You see? And this demonization of prophets is a strategic attempt to marginalize the religion of God. And please, I ask us all, be careful. You'll find the Quran elevates every prophet. Quran speaks of 25 prophets, roughly, but there are 124,000. But Quran gives us a sampling of them and says all of them are subservient to Allah. And I will prove it. You notice when Iblis, by the way, fell from grace, he says to Allah, allow me to take this human being till the day of judgment with me to hell. Allah says, I allow you. I allow you. Yawma yub'athun. Iblis, you want to do it? Allah says, but mine, you cannot touch. Iblis replies, فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ Iblis is saying this, shaitan is saying this, that I will fool them all except your purified chosen ones. So shaitan also knows I cannot touch the prophets and the imams. He's admitting it in the Quran that I can try to fool people, but not prophets and imams. I cannot do it. Mukhlasin in Arabic means intrinsically pure. Born pure at all times till their death. So please know that prophets remain pure. Now why is it important when we tell our children, obey the prophets, obey the imams. There is a hidden poison pill. If the child says, but this prophet, I've heard stories of him making mistakes or chasing women, or doing something terrible, like we hear the story of Dawood singing the praises of God from a biblical perspective, and that he sees Bathsheba, who's the mother of Suleiman, and he falls in love with her, but finds out she's married. This is scriptural, scripture. You know, the, the book of God is designed to guide us ethically, not to misguide us. You find that in this principle, you find that subhanallah, he realizes she is married, so he finds out who's her husband. They say, Uria, who's the commander in uh, Dawood's army. He says, Well, send him to the front lines. Hopefully, he'll get killed. And lo and behold, he goes and gets killed. He gets killed, and then she takes him, and she conceives Suleiman. Now, ask us all ethically. I'm hearing some conversations, if I can get some. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You find that if we follow such prescriptions, where we teach our children such behaviors, then a child comes to you and says, listen, you want me to be a believer in God? When his prophets and his representatives were so haphazard, and they committed all kinds of heinous crimes that I would never do in my lifestyle, in my lifetime. But you want me to be subservient to God? When the very messenger of God who God spoke to cannot correct himself, how should I make any efforts to be upright? And if I was the devil, what would I do? I'd go taint the general. I'd make the general look bad. Because once the general is corrupt, then the whole army is corrupt. This is the attempt done by people of society. Why I love the Quran is Quran reverses it and says false. These are false stories given to prophets and they were all honored and they were so great that Suleiman also, how great he was that while he's riding his horses and while he's in the pomp and glory of power, he stops when he sees the insects talking about him, the ants. He says, Rabbi awzi'ni an ashkura ni'mataka allati an amta alayya wa ala walidayh. My Lord, invoke in me gratitude for all the gifts you have given me and my parents. Subhanallah, a prophet of God with such high caliber, with so much power and pomp and glory that the queens of those arena would come towards him and they would submit to Islam due to his greatness and grandeur. Yet he wasn't arrogant. Rabbi awzi'ni an ashkura ni'mataka allati an'amta alayya wa ala walidayh wa an a'mala salihan put me, make my deeds right and make me among the salihin, put me among the worshippers. So that's the difference. You won't find stories like that in any scripture in the world. So I let me conclude here within the few minutes I have. You will find that when you read the surah, any surah, the foundation is this. Our prophets are guides. They've come to teach us how to worship God. And they're full of subservience. They're 
They come to prayer. Successful ones are the ones who pray with khushu. How do you get khushu if you don't understand the principles of how God created us? Why did he put us the way he did? What do you mean by Iblis slipping and Adam you know, coming to earth with his wife, Hawa? What do you mean by this? What's the, what's the modus? What's the goal behind it? When we have clarity there, yaqeen starts to form. And you are unafraid of any stories after that. Because foundationally, the deen of Allah is logical. It's rational, but it's also spiritual. That the foundation is logical, but then we take a leap towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll talk about this in detail, about tawakkul and dua. When we pray, people ask, how do you pray where your tears come out freely? How can I reach a stage that the minute I pray to God, my heart palpitates. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكُّلُ How do I reach that stage that my heart palpitates? It's this conversation. To understand, when you pray, understand this is not some de decree to keep us entertained. There's a movement. There's ruku, there's sujood, there's qiyam, there's qunut, there's jama'ah, there's a reason. Everything Allah has placed is for a reason. So, Sultan al-Mulk, in the last conclusions, Allah says, I will, I will end with this one. Uh, Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Ayah 23 to 30, quickly. Qul huwa alladhi ansha'akum wa ja'ala lakum as-sam'a wal absara wal af'ida Say, he it is who brought you into being, made you the ears and eyes and the hearts. Little it is that you give thanks. It's beautiful. It's consoling me. Meaning Allah says, be grateful. How important is that eye? How important are your ears? How important is what you have and the tongue that you have and the legs that you have? How important is it? Somebody came to me yesterday and said, brother, how do I get khushu in salah? I said, look around you. The Prophet said, man arafa nafsa faqad arafa rabba. When you know yourself, you will know your Lord. Look around you and see how much blessing is around us. Coming to this center right now, sitting together. We're going to break fast together. We're going to meet people of various cultures and, and languages and heights and sizes. Allah says, this is my rahmah. It's a barakah. Shake hands with them. Hug them. Even if they don't know you. Look at them. What a blessing. See that. You can lose that. This is a rahmah. And what if God took your legs away? What if he took something away from you? How difficult will your life be? Allah says, قَلِيلًا مَا تَشْكُرُونَ قُلْ هُوَ الَّذِي ذَرَأَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَإِلَيْهِ تُحْشَرُونَ He it is who multiplied you on earth and he will gather you. Meaning this is temporary. This world is temporary. So don't be fooled by it. But he gathered you. Full of mercy. It's very simple. In Surah Ibrahim, Allah says, وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ وَلَإِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِن عَذَابِ لَشَدِيد it's a principle coded on foundational basis that God has made a calling. If you are grateful, I will give you more. What is more? The mere satisfaction of realizing God's grace. You know, you sit in a room and you're thankful for what you have. You know how calming that is? You know how many diseases go away? You know how little drugs we have to touch because of that? Allah says, لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ not only will you get calmness, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'innul qulub, that when you do dhikr, do I calm you down, but I give you eternity of happiness. I give you much more. Now when you and I indulge in such thinking, then our prayers will be filled with spirit. Our dua will be, spilled, will be filled with spirit. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, مَا جَفَّتِ الدَّمُوا إِلَّا لِقَسْوَةِ الْقُلُوبِ وَمَا كَسَتِ الْقُلُوبِ إِلَّا لِكَثَّةِ الذُّنُوبِ Tears don't come out when hearts are hard. When hearts are hard. And hearts don't get hard unless they are filled with sin. Keep away from sin. And let the heart be pliant. And let's make dua. So Allah says, I've given this to you. Now look at the disbeliever. Prophet says, God spread you on this earth and he'll collect you in their arrogant way. Mata hadal wa'ad in kuntum sadiqeen. When is this going to happen? <laughs> Day of judgment. Ah, you just concocted this. It's just a joke. The Prophet replies, Allah says, قُلْ إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَإِنَّمَا أَنَا نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ 
say this knowledge is with God. The day of judgment is exclusively Allah's knowledge. I am a plain warner. I love this. Nazirun Mubin. I love it. God, Prophet is saying to me, I will make it very clear for you. You will have no doubt as to when I tell you there is a day of judgment. I will make it very clear. And if you're going to reject it, you're only doing it because you don't want to follow the truth. Now what's beautiful about this is that the next verse, which is verse 27, فَلَمَّا رَأَوْهُ الزُّلْفَةً سِيَتْ وُجُوهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَقِيلَ هَذَا الَّذِي كُنْتُمْ بِهِ تَدْدَعُونَ Beautiful verse. I love it. Because as soon as the disbeliever asks, مَتَى هَذَا الْوَعْدَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ The Prophet says, قُلْ إِنَّمَا الْإِلْمُ إِنَّ اللَّهِ This knowledge is with God. I'm a plain warner. The next verse, and when they shall see it, day of judgment, the faces of those who disbelieve shall be sorry. Like, oh my God, we disbelieved. We questioned. We were, we were actually making fun of the Prophet. And it shall be said. Remember yesterday you asked when? Well, here it is. And what I love about this verse construction is that actually in the scope of time, it will be so quick that though those who asked 1400 years ago, when they go into the grave, when they are raised, Allah will ask them, how long were you in the grave? He said, one day, maybe a little longer. Allah says, exactly. Now, when you see that day of judgment, it will be so quick that the Quran is saying, you see, in the scope of time, don't think day of judgment is too far. It is so near that the, even the ayah is describing it with quickness, that when they will see it, immediately they will be told, remember yesterday you asked, is there a day of judgment? Ah, here it is. He says, have you considered if Allah should destroy me and those with me, rather he will have mercy on us, then who will protect the unbelievers from a painful chastisement? Meaning when you are a disbeliever, you can't escape. And Allah will give them their due. The last part. It's so beautiful. Allah says to me, He says, you see those who ask about the day of judgment? Say to them, I believe in the merciful God and I have trust in Him. You soon you will know who is wrong. Hold on, God says. Don't lose your hope. Don't be fooled by those who try to confuse you in your minds to think that there's no day of judgment. And in the end, Allah says, قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُ مِنْ أَصْبَحَ مَاءَكُمْ غَوْرًا فَمَنْ يَأْتِيكُمْ بِمَعِنْ مَعِينَ And if the sky doesn't throw water on you from the clouds, who will flood your rivers? Beautiful verse, it leaves me. 